So I'm a longtime engineer, 25 years of experience in computer and hardware design, um, different all sorts of industries, automotive, telecom, most recently infant toy development, which is a little bit interesting. Uh, mo at least half of that was an FPGA experience. So I've done FPGA design and just about all those jobs through that 25 years. Um, I'm here with a group from Atlanta. We actually produced the Vintage Computer Festival Southeast. So if you're ever down there in late April, early May, come see us. Uh, there's a lot of us here roaming around. Earl here is our executive producer. And there's different people here. But I go to a lot of Vintage Computer Festivals. It's my favorite thing to do. This is actually our favorite show, as I was talking about earlier. Um, it is going to take me a little while to learn names, though. So if I don't quite, hey, you're, you're so and so, just bear with me. Um, I do have a website, it's retrotronics.org, although right now there's not a lot of information on it. There's some of my projects that I've done in the past. Uh, one of probably the most popular is the Junior IDE, which is an expansion for PC Junior. So check that out. On VC forums, I go by EE Guru, and my avatar is this uh, perfectly taken self selfie of mine. So yeah, so if you ever see that, you know that's me. Least favorite activity is reading Vogon poetry, uh, which it's kind of how this project started, which I'll get to as I go through it. Uh, if you're not familiar, familiar with Vogons.org, it's kind of a DOS retro computing enthusiast forum. Uh, uh, it's not, well, a lot of distracted people on Vogons.org. It's, it's not really focused. So if you're looking for a concise discussion, don't go to Vogons. So my first experiences was with this computer. I got it when I was a preteen. Uh, if you're, most people in here are probably not familiar with it, it's called a VIC-20. It's got a CPU that you've probably never heard of called a 6502. Um, I wrote my first Space Invaders game on it and I've been hooked ever since. That kind of started me off on the journey. Then I moved into this beast. It's a Tandy 1000, also a fairly rare machine. Um, but that kind of led me to these two people. Uh, Ken, and, Ken and Roberta Williams of Sierra Online Software. They wrote a lot of adventure games in the 80s, and I was hooked. I actually kind of learned the paths in King's Quest that you could take to not swap disks as frequently. So I learned where all the disk swap borders were and could play the game through more efficiently. When my first bad disk happened in a Sierra game, I cried. It's like, you know, how do I get another one? So then I opened up the little Sierra catalog that came with it, and it had all sorts of... Uh, hardware in it for different, you know, Sierra would promote hardware along with their software, like a Roland MT32. That kind of led me to this computer, which is my first real computer because it had a hard drive. It's a Northgate 386 generic IBM PC clone, but it's significant because it's a downgrade from the Tandy in terms of sound. You know, it just had a PC speaker in it. It didn't have Tandy's three voice proprietary sound system. So that kind of led me to going to Electronics Boutique in our local mall and looking up and seeing this thing, which is a Sound Blaster original. And so I had to have something to play my Sierra games, because otherwise, you know, how am I going to listen to you know, the, the fairy wandering in the woods and having to chase her? So. so I saved up my pennies and bought one of these things, came home, and I was hooked again on Sierra. But then, like I said, Sierra was marketing hardware along with their games to kind of promote cross-promote other companies, and if you flip through the back of the catalog, you see, well, the first thing I saw was the CMS upgrade for the, uh, Tandy, or for the Sound Blaster 1.5, so you could actually upgrade this to a creative music system or Game Blaster, did that. But the next thing you see is this thing called a Roland MT32, and that was in the back of the catalog, and it was, uh, it's basically the synthesizer unit out of a, a modern Roland keyboard at the time. It just didn't have the keyboard controller attached to it. And it was intended for musicians to use their computers to start creating music. But if you look down at the price tag, it said $600. $600. And as a teenager, that might as well have been 6,000, because there's no way, like, that was just, I mean, it was, it was the end all holy grail of sound for Sierra games, but there's just no way that I could afford it on my salary. So enter college, and I went to the University of Arkansas my freshman year. At the, end of the, at the end of the term, I checked my balance, and after all the tuition and room and board and everything was paid, I had extra money. 
and it was like $250, and it was the state grant that got dispersed late and wasn't you know, refunded to us early in the semester. So end of fall term, Christmas era, it's like I had money burning holes in my pocket, so I went down to the local computer store and bought this thing, Gravis Ultrasound, uh, one of the early wavetable cards for a PC. And I went home and I had to find the killer app to play my Gus, and it happened to be a game called Doom. And so I spent like the first night or the first day like playing Doom with the ultrasound turned on and hearing like the panoramic sound and the imps coming from behind me and the music and stuff. And before you know it, the sun had gone down and my dorm room was dark and I was just scared to death, you know, trying to figure out where the next imp was going to, you know, attack me from. So that kind of started my journey on, uh, on computing and sound. So if you haven't noticed, here lately there's been a lot of really talented people making new sound cards for old PCs. And it's kind of swirling around vogons.org. That's where a lot of the activity has been happening. And some of these projects I'll go through kind of quickly. But this is a uh, MIF board. Uh, it's actually started by James Pierce, who does uh, lowtech.uk. It's basically for connecting a uh, Roland MPU-401, so you can hook up an MT32 to a PC. It's a reproduction. These are actually MPU-401 on an Isocard clones, and there's several people doing them. Uh, mostly, again, coming out of the Vogons community. Karopi has done one. Um, Alex Swedenberg, who goes by AB, ABOTJ on Vogons. Uh, some of the other ones, this is a Tandy three voice clone on the top left. So this is uh, the sound standard that came out of the IBM PC Junior that Tandy later picked up and kind of took the name of. There's another one by James Pierce, the same guy who did the first uh, MIF board. This is a uh, creative music system clone. So if you ever heard of the Game Blaster, which was a popular clone of CMS back in the day. There's here, there's one, several OPL2 projects, or OPL2 or OPL3 projects. This is by Sergey um, Kislyev. He lives in Seattle. He actually is uh, big into other things. He's made XT clones and VGA clones. This is another one by Eric Schaeffler, uh, who actually cloned it so precisely that he, he got the silkscreen ad lib logo correct, which a lot of people have you know, taken issue with because it's copyright. This is a one from uh, Kevin Williams, TechSelect in Texas. It's actually a dual um, OPL, or it's actually an OPL3, so it actually has four output channels, so you can do four OPL outputs. So you can do left, right, front, left, right, rear, which is kind of interesting. These are, um, so there's a, a guy in, I'm not sure which country he's in, he, he runs Serta Shop. He's actually made these things called Dream Blasters. And if you've ever seen some of these sound cards, they have what's called a Wave Blaster header on, which you can actually take a MIDI synthesizer and put it on the card like, and create more rich music than normal FM synthesis or wavetable would normally output. So this is a Dream Blaster. It's got a MIDI synth engine on it. Uh, this is actually the fir or one of the first clones of the actual Sound Blaster. So this is a guy named Labs on, on uh, Vogons who's created a, not an accurate reproduction of the Sound Blaster, but something that's Sound Blaster compatible. And then Eric Schaeffler did one that's perfectly compatible with the Sound Blaster. So this is trace accurate, chip accurate, component accurate. But instead of using the actual Sound Blaster logo like he did with the AdLib logo before, he called it a snark barker rather than a Sound Blaster. So, and you can actually buy most of these kits. I mean, everybody's building them in their basements and they'll sell you bare PCBs or they'll sell you complete kits, but you know, the availability is kind of sketchy depending on what components they have and, and how they're building. This is a, this is a madman named Tito on, on Vogons who's done all sorts of Yamaha boards. So these are Yamaha synths that are mostly Sound Blaster compatible. Uh, so this is a guy named Fager who did a uh, Innovation SSI 201 clone, which is an ISA card with a SID chip. So there's a few games out there that support it. And then he was crazy enough to do one with a dual SID chip. Uh, and now he's actually doing a project similar to this one where he's trying to do the same sort of thing, but, out, but a little bit different. Uh, this is the first kind of what I would call a Gus clone. It's actually using the AMD Interwave IC, which is the part that came out on the ultrasound PNP 
but he, he found some new old stock of those parts and he's built a new ice cart around it. But that project's gone on for four or five years without him actually shipping, you know, many. So, so those are kind of a, a survey of what's all going on in the reproduction sound card world. But the problem with all these projects is these are thumbnails of everything I just showed you. If you took all these sound cards and tried to shove them into one machine, you, you just physically couldn't do it. Like even if you took one instance of every sound card standard, you couldn't put them in a machine just because you didn't have enough slots, right? So, and not to mention, who here has ever had a conflict with IRQs and DMA on PC? How many have been frustrated by it? I know I have. So that Northgate 386 I told you about has a Sound Blaster 1.5 upgraded to 1.0. It's got a ultrasound and it has an LAPCI, which is an MT32 on a card. And it was just a nightmare trying to get all the IRQs and DMAs fixed just with that setup with three cards, not let alone you know, everything that's out there. So you know, one of the problems is IRQ and DMA. Another problem is who here has been able to figure out what your CPU is doing just based on the noise floor coming out your sound card? The buzz, right? I mean, I can tell exactly, you know, if I do a directory listing, I can hear the pitch of the, the low noise change, right? So it's all analog. It's, it's right next to high frequency digital circuitry. It's picking up a lot of those harmonics and it's just radiating them out the analog port. So there's really no good digital solution. So people that, like uh, streamers, archivists, YouTubers, to try to capture a clean digital output of a sound card is challenging. There's just not a lot of ways to do it. Plus, if you have lots of sound cards in your, in your machine, you have to tie them all together somehow. Like a lot of people will take the output of one, running it into the input of the other, the output of that one into the input of another. All that analog noise compounds, it adds up. Otherwise, you have to buy a mixer, run it all to an external mixer. It just becomes a little bit of an unmanageable nightmare. And lastly, cost. I mean, some of these sound cards are actually going up, up, up in price. I don't think an ultrasound is sold on eBay for under $200 in the past three or four years. So that's basically the price that I paid for it back in 1990. So the thing is, is like, why can't we? Well, this is an actual ad. This is a parody ad that came out of Maximum Computing PC in September of 99. So it's kind of hard to read up here, so I'll give you some of the highlights. So this was a parody ad with all the popular 3D video cards, you know, crammed onto one ISA sound card. And the idea was uh, made by Video Loca. It's obviously a parody ad. It has an all-in-one Rage 128, a Matrix G400, NVIDIA TNT2, Voodoo 3, and a Savage 4 all on one card. And of course, it's kind of a massively long card. 256 meg of LMNOP RAM, which I think is awesome. I've been trying to find that ever since. 425 bungholio marks, you know, measured by the, the picture of the card on the graph, which is awesome. <laughs> and ugly mother heat sinks sold separately. I don't know how much they cost, but you know, definitely worth it. My favorite thing is we put it in a steel cage octagon with all the other leading 3D cards, and while none of the cards actually moved, we're confident the bitching fast 3D 2000 would have kicked all the other cards' asses. <laughs> so really, really awesome. So, and if you haven't seen it, there's actually a guy on YouTube who has made a real reproduction of this thing. And don't, don't, don't search for it now because it'll suck an hour of your life, I guarantee it. But it's basically, he's made a, a, a working functional model of it. He's, he's hot glued a lot of things onto the card, but it looks really, really good. And he's actually wrote like Windows drivers and stuff that actually show the card listed. And, and he's, he's done a Bungholio Mark speed test that will show you. Worthy, worthy of seeing, but it got me thinking, like, why can't this be real? It's 2019, right? We've got FPGAs, we've got i9s, we've got gigahertz processors, we've got all the technology in the world. I mean, we could certainly take these five video cards and put them on a card and make them coexist. Why we'd want to, I don't know, but. So, this is 2019. Enter FPGAs. Um, who here has no clue what an FPGA is? Okay. I'm gonna get into that a little bit. Who's worked with them before? Okay, great, this will be easy talk then. So. I'm so glad you asked. 
I got to go through this a little bit just to kind of give some background as to actually what an FPGA is. So I'll bear with me a minute. This may get a little bit of eye glazing looks from you, but I'll, I'll try to rush through it. So every single digital computer, every single digital circuit is made up of three building blocks. And whether it's an i9 in your modern desktop or whether it's uh, you know, a microcontroller or whether it's just something to blink an LED, it's made up of three basic functional building blocks and I'll kind of walk through what those are. An FPGA is really, um, I like to use the, the equivalency of a stem cell. You know, if you look at the human body, we, you know, every single organ in your body has cells. Some of them are heart cells, some are brain cells, some of them are skin cells. But starting out, they don't know what they're going to be. Uh, that's kind of like how an FPGA works. It's got all of these functional building blocks, but they're not wired yet. They haven't received their DNA programming. So you can kind of turn them into anything that you want. So if you think of it, I'll kind of go through this as I'm going through it. Um, so the first part of what an FPGA is is what's called combinatorial logic. Any, who's here heard of a lookup table, or a, not a lookup table, but a truth table? Like, you know, if you, if you think of an AND gate, an AND gate typically has two inputs and one output. And the output is one if the input A and the input B is one, otherwise it's zero. And you can express that in terms of these tables, which just list for every possible combination of input, here's, here's the output result. And that's all a combinatorial element is. It's just a, uh, a transfer table, a fun transfer function. It's just saying, given these sets of inputs, here's an output. And the simplest example of that is a ROM. So if you think of a ROM, it's got a bunch of address lines coming in and a bunch of data lines coming out. So depending on the combination of address lines, you get whatever's stored at that location on the output data lines. So a lookup table is really just small little ROMs that do um, truth tables, that store truth tables for logic. The second element, and that's really used to kind of do the if-then-else functions of digital logic. The second building block is what's called a flip-flop, which is just storage. It, a flip-flop stores a single bit of data, so a zero or a one. And if you want like an eight-bit register, you just string eight flip-flops together. If you want a 32-bit register, you string 32 flip-flops together. And here's some examples they're, they're of kind of how they look in digital circuitry. But they just store one bit. And then the last thing in a, in a, of a building block of a digital circuit is the interconnect. So it's how things are wired together. So everything from the smallest microcontroller up to the biggest i9 to the biggest supercomputer is just a lot of combinatorial functions, a lot of flip-flops, and a lot of interconnects. And how that usually manifests itself is that um, you have a certain state, like the current state, and then you take that current state and you add some inputs to it, you go through a combinatorial lookup, and that determines what the next state is. And then you, you supply a clock to control that loop and that's called a finite state machine, and every digital circuit's made out of one. And so the way you kind of um, work with FPGAs is with what's called a high-level description language, so something like Verilog or VHDL, where instead of drawing a circuit diagram of what an AND gate looks like, you code it in a text editor. And if you want an AND gate, that's exactly how it looks in Verilog. C equals A and B, so they both have to be one for C to be one. And a flip-flop looks like what's at the bottom, it's at the positive edge of clock, output equals input. And so whenever that rising edge of clock hits, it'll, it'll transfer and store that bit. And there's a lot of high-level description languages out there. Um, these are some of them. Verilog, VHDL are probably the most popular. Couple is actually fairly popular in the retro community because it runs on parts that are 8-bit, or 8, or sorry, 5-volt through-hole parts, which are useful for 5-volt machines. Um, But if you were to code an application, like a, a large enterprise server application, you wouldn't throw every single line of code into main, right? Um, you would do kind of an architectural, software architectural approach to design. You would start with basic building blocks, like I need to print a character. And you'd write some code to print that character. And you'd put that in a function. And then you'd group those functions into In a traditional software, like procedural software language, you would write small amounts of code, you'd group that code into functions, those functions would go into object files, put those object files in a collection of library to do a bigger task, and then you'd write an application on, to on top of like a lot of libraries. It's kind of a, a hierarchical, modular design to software development. 
Well, you do the same thing with FPGAs. So if you think of an i9 that has billions and billions of gates, how do you, how do you write those transfer functions to connect a billion gates to each other? You don't. You start with small functional blocks and you start to build up. And this is the equivalent in an FPGA circuit. You start with small amounts of code to do trivial tasks like blink an LED or to output a bit or to create a pin. And you group that into modules. Modules become cores. Cores become subsystems and that becomes final designs. So if you think of um, just something like an 8088, it was all written in a high level description language. And then some tool took that language and created the, the metal mask that they actually used to, to, to etch the part. In a system on chip, in a, uh, in a system on chip, something that does something um, that's multifunctional, that has several large functional blocks in it, um, like a, uh, like an ARM processor that's in the Raspberry Pi. It's got a lot of different things in it. It's got DMA controllers, it's got video controllers, it's got CPUs, it's got storage controllers. Usually you'll, cre you'll code each one of those functional components as a, what's called a core in FPGA language. The core would be like a memory controller. It would be like a, a video output controller. And those cores would be connected via a bus. Um, and so I'm kind of using the sound example here. Like if we wanted to create all of these sound card standards within one ISA card, we would create smaller functional pieces that would do part of the design. So in this case, like a Gravis ultrasound core and a Sound Blaster core and an MPU 401 core. And those would be internally connected through what's called a bus. And in this particular case, we're using a wishbone bus, which is a standardized thing in the open source community. And then down here at the bottom, we create kind of a bridge that would connect this bus to the outside world, like to the ISA bus, for example. And so this is kind of how we can break down um, the one card to rule them all that would have every sound card standard in it into something that can be uh, created in a modular way. And so there's a, there's a site out on the internet called opencores.org. And it's where a lot of the open source FPGA, Verilog, VHDL projects are stored. And if you go there, there's a lot of really cool stuff. Uh, if you hit some of these drop down tabs, you'll see video controllers, sound controllers, storage controllers, just about everything that you can imagine on there, including some of the things that are out there, like the AO486, which is an open source 486 system on a chip, which has a built in VGA controller and a built in sound blaster and a built in AdLib and, and some of the other cores in it. Uh, Next 186 is some of the same things. You can actually take some of these cores off open cores, put them on an FPGA board, and actually run a DOS computer inside of them because they'll emulate the CPU all the way to all the output peripherals. But one thing that hasn't really been done yet is um, most of the cores on this site are really meant to be run on. Uh, eval boards from FPGA vendors. So things like the uh, DE Zero Nano, which is a small board you can buy for what, $100, $200? Yeah, so there's, there's several eval boards out there where you can actually run, connect a VGA cable up to it and actually run a DOS computer. But there's no hardware project out there that's really tried to put an FPGA on things like an ISA card before. Um, so that's kind of the genesis of this. So I'm going to kind of talk specifically about the project I'm working on. So the idea is to take an ISA card and start by putting a medium-sized FPGA in the middle of it. And in this case, I'm using a Lattice ECP5, which has got 45,000 lookup tables, or 45,000 of those small little ROMs on it. And it has about the same number of flip-flops. Inside it, we're going to start putting sound cards, sound cores, starting with what I call the, the big three. So Gravis Ultrasound, um, first wavetable card, came out early 90s. Sound Blaster 16 DSP, and then uh, MPU for, intelligent MPU 401. So you can connect external things like a Roland MT32. And then the plan is to continually add cores to it. So OPLs to give ad lib emulation, Windows Sound System, which actually started with the ultrasound, um, Tandy 3 Voice, uh, Creative Music System, Kovacs, uh, Commodore SID, even, even kind of snoop on the internal speaker traffic so that when your PC beeps, it'll actually come out the sound card's output. Uh, Pro Audio Spectrum actually did that back in the day. 
Uh, and then IBM Music Feature Card is another big one that, that's on my list to add. To the side of that, we, we need memory. So if we're going to do wavetable cards, you have to have somewhere where you can store uh, sample storage. The ultrasound had up to a megabyte of RAM on it. The PMP had like 16 mega RAM. Like the AW32s and AW64s had much more. So it'll have RAM on it. And then I'm adding, I've added an audio DSP. Um, and uh, that has these functions in it. So it'll have aux port, so you can connect like CD audio, auxiliary audio, line in, mic in, uh, mixer to mix all of those signals. Everything inside the FPGA will be mixed internally, but you'll have to mix these audio ports with everything else. Uh, parametric EQ, which I'll talk about. So there's actually enough DSP capacity in the audio DSP to, to do like 15 band stereo parametric. And then it's things like space, some trick effects like spatializer, where you can turn on reverb, echo, and like fat stereo, and kind of take what would normally sound really good, like on an ultrasound, and make it sound even better. All, you can turn all of it off, though. And then the idea is to connect this up to ISA and then MCA. Um, I actually will talk about that in a minute, because there, there's a real good reason to connect it up to MCA. That's microchannel architecture, for those that aren't familiar. Um, so those are the two bus architectures I'm targeting. Um, the reason I'm not doing anything else is because things like PCI, there's plenty of stuff on eBay today to kind of do PCI sound. And once you start getting into like the Windows uh, 95, 98 world, it kind of all standardized on Windows sound system. And then we start to get into what I would, what some of my friends would call feature creep, but I'm going to defend it. So. Since we have memory out here, and a lot of it, it's actually hard to put less than about eight mega, megabytes of RAM on a card, just because once you get past the SRAM cost and you start getting into dynamic RAM, it, RAM becomes super cheap. I mean, you could put 32, 64, 128 meg on it pretty cheap. So if you have all that RAM, you might as well backfill ISA. So backfill conventional memory, offer EMS, offer XMS, because it's free. It's an FPGA. It actually costs nothing. You just have to write a little code. So once you do that, and you've actually you know, maximized your PC RAM, well, now what are you going to do for storage? So all you really have to do is add a micro SD card, and you could do an XT IDE type equivalent for an SD card. So that, that costs very, very little for a lot of functionality, right? Now Wave Blaster. You know, every card that came out in the 90s had a Wave Blaster header, so you could put a MIDI module on it. So that costs very little to actually put the header on there to support the module. It's just really real estate for the standoffs. So if we're putting a Wave Blaster header on there, well, what are most people going to do with a Wave Blaster? Like the Wave Blaster daughter cards are super expensive. They're collector's items, kind of. The cheapest one you can buy now is what's called a Dream Blaster X2. So let's, let's just put a Dream Blaster X2 on it instead, just to have it built in. And I'll talk about this a little bit more in detail. Uh, and then once we get to that point, um, why not add an ESP32? Just why not? So, so, the reason, so the reason this originally got mentioned is I watched a YouTube video of a YouTuber who was, who was uh, reviewing what's called the Commodore CDTV. So it's basically an Amiga 500 in a set-top box form factor that Commodore tried to market in the 90s. And the reason that he loved it was that you could play all of the Amiga 500 games on it, but then if you pushed in a CD while you were playing a game, it would mix in the CD audio into your game, sort of like Redbook Audio. So you could actually kind of play your own soundtrack to the game that you were playing, and he thought that that was kind of novel. So that originally kind of sparked this ESP32 thing, where you could actually, what if you paired a Bluetooth source to your sound card and you could play your own soundtrack and get your phone notifications through your sound card. <laughs> the reason it's brought up is I'll, I'll delve into it a little bit further, but it, it was, it's easy to add. I've been doing a lot of ESP32 development the last few years, and I'm, I'm very familiar. I have a lot of code developed for ESP32. So. so the mission statement. This is what I'm trying to aspire to with this project. Interoperability over compatibility. And that just means that when, whatever software you want to use, whatever menu option you pick, it just works. So if you load up 688 attack sub, it's going to have you know, five or six different sound card choices. Pick any of them, and it'll work. If you have uh, original Gravis Ultrasound PMP install disks, put them in your DOS box, run the setup program, it'll just work. 
it may not be 100% compatibility compatible, especially initially, just in terms of sound reproduction. There might be bugs, glitches, something it doesn't do quite right. But the idea is to make it as interoperable over the widest range of sound card standards and software as possible. And then we'll, once it goes open source, we'll work on compatibility later. And one of the things that is kind of important about the way this works is um, because all these sound card standards, all these sound cores are on one ISA card, there's only one set of things like IRQ and DMA lines. So you really don't have to worry about with compatibility conflicts with any of the cores on the card because the, the IRQ and DMA arbitrator, arbitrator and Muxer will actually handle that. So now really the idea is to put one card in your machine. You have every single sound card ever made You've got SD card storage, you've got Bluetooth, which you've got Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi internet, and you've also got um, memory backfill and storage, well, memory backfill and storage. So you're using only one slot for all those things. This is where it'll get kind of interactive a little bit. Um, let's see if I can switch this. So this is the current, um, This is the current layout. Uh, I was hoping to have this actually running for this show, but um, due to my August distractions, it didn't quite happen. So I'm kind of about halfway through the layout. Uh, this is the Lattice CCP5. Uh, this is what's called HyperRAM off next to it. This is actually uh, 64 meg of flash and eight, or 16 meg of RAM. I've got another SD RAM up here because I'm a little bit worried about HyperRAM timing. Uh, these are bus translators to do level translation of voltage down here from the ISA bus. The DSP logic is going here. I've actually got a reference circuit that I'm going to drop in at some point. Uh, and then up here, most of this empty area is for the wave blaster footprint with the wave blaster header here at the top. And then some headers up here for things like uh, speaker input output, CD aux in, you know, digital out, um, an expansion header. And then on the back, uh, micro SD card socket at the top for storage. Um, RPSMA connector for the Wi-Fi Bluetooth antenna because most of the cases are metal and PC and it's a Faraday cage and you can't really get RF out. Uh, main line out on TRS 3.5 uh, millimeter. And then a second three, TRS 3.5 for aux in and mic in that's switchable. And it's also switchable to surround output. So there's an analog switch. So you can do either surround output or uh, input. And then, a, you know, every sound card has to have a joystick with MIDI, so MIDI breakout. Um, let's see if I can pull up another. So there is an expansion header on the card, and it is for this. Open recent. So the idea is to have, so, so for people that want extra ports on the card, you can actually run a cable over to a second ISA card bracket. And that ISA card bracket will carry some additional connectors. And it will carry TRS MIDI in and out, so you don't have to use the joystick breakout box that most sound cards have with it. It'll have a speed if out for the purists that want to actually capture digital audio from their sound card. And it'll also have USB audio out, which is coming from the Dream, which will actually be able, you can plug it into a modern computer and you can actually see a USB audio device and record to it or play to it. Um, and then for, they'll have another uh, TRS output for dedicated rear surround. So you can do line in on your primary and then dedicated surround on the secondary. But most people aren't going to need the extra connectors, so I don't expect a lot of people would run this extra bracket. So let me get back to my slides. So I already went through connectors. So the cores that are plausible, and I'll kind of talk through what is possible and what's kind of underway and what's um, going to be in the first release. So I'm almost done with the, inter with the ultrasound core. I've got all the register file implemented. I've got the, uh, the wavetable mixer mostly done. I just don't have it where it's actually outputting correct audio at the moment. I just didn't have enough time to complete that process. But it's nearly written. Um, so I think ultrasound, including ultrasound PNP compatibility, is uh, going to be 100% from day one. Windows Sound System is actually an evolution of the ultrasound daughter codec board that actually was part of the ultrasound Max and the later Interwave chips. 
Um, it's uh, an ADI and Crystal Audio based standard. So Windows Sound System will kind of come with the ultrasound support. Sound Blaster DSP um, is fairly trivial to add. A lot of people have done Sound Blaster stuff before, and that's just the DSP part, not the AdLib part. Um, it's a fairly limited command set. It's really just a DMA engine that pushes stuff to a codec. So I think uh, those will all be easily possible in the first release later in the year. MPU4, Intelligent MPU401 is planned, and that's just to do the intelligent mode interface where it will actually do a conductor style pacing of MIDI output messages, as well as a pacing of sysx messages so like an MT32 doesn't get overflowed on a modern computer. Um, AdLib and OPL are a little bit difficult. So there's some implementations of OPL 2 and 3 out on the internet, but I haven't reviewed the licenses for them, and they don't, they're, they don't produce sound very accurately. Or if they do, they require an enormous amount of, of logic. And it's just a, an enormous undertaking to actually do that myself, so I'm probably, once this goes open source, I'll bring those open source cores in and it'll have OPL on it. Until then, it's probably gonna be probably a hard OPL3 external to the FPGA. Uh, creative music system is fairly straightforward. It's just a three voice uh, modulated square wave. Actually, creative music system isn't. Uh, Tandy is three wave uh, modulated square. Um, CMS, I haven't quite looked at the technical details, but I might try to undertake that core before I resort to using somebody else's open source option. Um, SID, Again, I think once it goes open source, we'll have to bring in some of the current FPGA SID, or SID modules that are out there, but I don't think any of them actually have source code released. So uh, that's a little bit questionable. Uh, Tandy PC Junior 3 voice is modulated square. It's fairly easy to implement. P same way with PC honker snooping, PC speaker snooping. Um, compressed audio, uh, there's a lot of open source libraries out there like Lib Trimmer that are meant to be run on uh, fixed point MCUs. So you can put a soft MCU in the FPGA to do compressed MP3 playback. So that's potentially possible. Um, I've already implemented Kovox Disney Sound Source. I needed something to test audio output, and Kovox is literally the simplest sound card standard out there. It's just a resistor ladder. So that's actually coming out the DAC. Um, IBM Music Feature is almost like a MPU 401. It's just an intelligent mode MIDI interface with a, a Yamaha synth on it. So that's probably doable via daughter Wave Blaster board. And then there's some others that are probably unlikely, like Pro Audio Spectrum and Turtle Beach. I'm doing on time, I'm almost there. So Wave Blaster, um, every sound card needs a Wave Blaster header. This is the Serta Shop um, Wave, or Dream Blaster X2. It uses a Dream SAM uh, 55A04. I've already got the eval board, the SDK, the kit. I've written a lot of the software for it, and it actually works pretty well. So that'll be on the first run of the prototypes. So you, know, you wouldn't have to buy a 75 euro Dream Blaster to get you know, full MIDI synth from day one. Um, so the other idea I had was to basically, uh, a lot of people try to get accurate MT32 reproduction on their sound card, and they do it through something called Munt which is a software package that takes MIDI messages and does the MIDI synth part of it. And a lot of people will do it on a modern Windows desktop, but um, several will try a Raspberry Pi 3. And a Raspberry Pi 3 has just enough horsepower to do the MIDI synth for an MT4, MT32. So the idea was to take, I don't know if I have a slide on it, um, take, a, take this on the left, which is a Raspberry Pi compute module. It's a Raspberry Pi 3 that's actually running in a card edge form factor and put that on a Wave Blaster daughter card. So the idea is you'd have a Raspberry Pi on the Wave Blaster daughter card to actually run Munt and feed the MIDI synth back into the sound card engine. So that's not really a related project, but that's something that'll be released about the same time. So here's where the feature creep explanation comes in. So ESP32. So Bluetooth. Um, as I already kind of talked about, you know, you could have a custom streaming soundtrack coming in from another device like your phone. That was the genesis of it. But the other thing that would be nice with Bluetooth is uh, wireless game controllers. So the ability to pair like a PS4 game controller with this card and have it emulate a standard 201 port address joystick with your PS4 controller. So anything that has PC joystick support will just work. Um, 
And then eventually there would be an app experience with it. So, so a lot of the things in the DSP, like the parametric EQ, the reverb, the chorus, uh, the mixing, if you have like two different cores running at the same time and you want to adjust the relative volume of the two cores, you could pull out your phone that's already paired with the card and pull up the mixer for all the different cores in the sound card and actually adjust them dynamically. And there's frilly things here, like if you're running Wavetable, you could actually look at all the 32 voice channels and see VU meters per channel or, or whatever. But it, the hardware's there. The idea is to put the hardware in Rev1, and the software is the, well, it's not the easy part, but it's the part that can be added incrementally just by reflashing the FPGA. We're getting a little bit low on time. So Wi-Fi. So if you're adding an ESP32, it's actually fairly easy to bridge uh, RMII coming off the Wi-Fi to its wireless interface. So the idea would put a standard networking core in the FPGA and bridge its RMII output to that on the ESP32. So the idea is via config utility, you would set your SSID and your WPA2 password, and it would appear as an NE2000 to your PC. And you could run whatever software would normally work with an NE2000 and have automatic Wi-Fi. I'm not sure if I'm gonna have enough time to go through this, because I only have about five minutes left, but um, there's a lot of challenges um, to doing this, um, and I'll just give you an overview. The ISA bus is asynchronous, which means that there's really no clock. Uh, and the interesting thing about the ISA bus is data is only valid on the deasserting clock edge, in other words, the rising clock, clock edge of negative logic. So it's only gonna sample read data at this point where the read strobe actually goes back high. And, like any SRAM, the SRAM is only going to latch write data whenever you drop the write strobe. So by the time you assert any strobe, a read or a write, on the ISA bus and go all the way to the end of it, a lot of FPGA clocks can go by. Well, why is that important? Well, in the FPGA, you've got a lot of different cores accessing common resources, like, for example, the wavetable RAM. So you have a wavetable engine running, making sound, doing reads and writes from the external memory, we well, also have the ability to read and write that external memory through the ISA bus or via PIO or DMA transfer. So you have to arbitrate ISA accesses with the wavetable synthesizer access to that external memory. Well, if the ISA bus is going to tie up all of these FPGA clock cycles through this entire strobe asserted period, it's blocking other cores like the wavetable core from actually accessing that RAM. So there's some problems here where you actually have to kind of buffer and latch some of the read accesses, and you have to kind of pipeline and cache some of the write accesses to make an asynchronous bus behave nicely with a synchronous bus pattern. Because uh, most everything on the synchronous bus is a single clock, with the exception of a couple wait states. So write data is already presented when the write strobe is asserted, and read data is latched on the very next clock cycle after the read cycle is complete. So there's a lot of logic here just in terms of that ISA to wishbone bridge that um, if you want more detail, just come over to my booth and I can walk you through some of the code on it. Uh, advance. Advance, okay. Um, I'm not gonna play this whole video. Um, so one of the problems I had in building this is debugging. Because when you're debugging any FPGA logic, the simplest thing to do is run a lot of the signals out to a logic analyzer so you can kind of see how things are transitioning inside the part. Well, I didn't have enough pins. So what I did was I took a couple extra pins that I had, or one extra pin that I had, and ran a NeoPixel strip. And I'm actually not on the internet, so I can't play this. I don't have it connected. Um, but this is basically a light strip in my office where I'm basically, I've got, you know, 50 or so LEDs there that are just, you know, kind of running off a NeoPixel strip to show me the statuses of certain registers and stuff, just so I can see, is this value correct? Is this value correct? And write a utility to step through it and see it advancing. It's a block diagram, it's an eye chart. So why microchannel? I'm glad you asked. So this is me a couple years ago at Tandy Assembly, the first one that they had in Ohio. Um, the machine there on the right is a Tandy 5000 MC. It's one of my pride and joys. Uh, you shouldn't covet. God told us not to, but I, I covet that machine. Um, so it's actually a working machine. It's a working 5000 MC, and that's actually significant because Tandy was one of the only companies to license microchannel from IBM for reproduction. So I want a sound card for that machine. <laughs> you know. 
So I don't know if you've seen these. This is crazy. This is insanity. So these are two Sound Blaster, six, or Sound Blaster Pro microchannel cards that sold recently. Almost over $2,500 and almost $1,200. So microchannel sound cards are unobtainium. They are super rare. I actually sold the Sound Blaster non-pro one that I had for $400 right after I saw these sell. So I guess the pro, or I guess the pro is more desirable. But. So I've actually gone down the path of microchannel. Um, this is actually a real card. I'm not going to pull it up in Eagle because we're running low on time. But, um, so this is a test card to basically put all the translation logic for microchannel. And I've gotten PIO accesses working. I just haven't gotten DMA accesses working. Um, so this is basically a proof of concept. If I can get the microchannel to wishbone bridge working, then everything else should work with a microchannel sound card um, design. There are some sacrifices. The I.O. panel is not as big on a microchannel slot. So things like uh, the SD card may have to move internally. I'm probably not going to do the secondary I.O. bracket for microchannel just because the card height is not as big. It's not going to fit a Wave Blaster card, for example. So the future. Uh, Short-term plans is I'm hoping by Thanksgiving to have like the first prototype built, to actually have it running with the ultrasound core running in it, which I'm pretty close to getting it running on a test card. This is actually, a, I built a series of test cards before I went to the BGA route. This is actually one of them that's actually running Covox logic and has most of the ultrasound support built into it uh, just to test the DSP and some of the other memory access parts of the card. So I can show these over at my, uh, my station in Hall D um, after the talk. So by Christmas, try to get Sound Blaster and Intelligent MPU 401 in it. And then I'm hoping to kickstart it sometime first half of next year. So the idea is to launch it on kickstart. I will probably have a primary goal to fund the project, obviously, and then a secondary goal to, er to early release open source versions of the code. So there, when it comes to open source, there's a, couple of, there's a couple concerns. So the simple answer is it will be open source. But the problem is, is there's a significant amount of monetary and time investment into this project. Just the BGA prototypes alone will be, you know, three or four thousand dollars, just to get enough cards and parts and everything. So, and if I do a kickstart, I don't want to do a kickstart where I build 200 boards, maybe build another 200 beyond the kickstart, so that I can actually sell them after the kickstart ends, and then have China cloners come in and undercut me and then I'm left with 200 cards that I can't sell because somebody in China has built them for half the price. So it will be open source, but probably not initially, which might delay some of the cores being added that are particularly open source. But if I get enough funds raised in the Kickstart, I'll open source it immediately as a stretch goal. Uh, so it depends on when it will be open sourced. So there's not much running today. Um, the only thing that I have actually that I can demo is the Covox. So I can actually demo it stereo, 32 kilohertz, just to show the DSP dynamically working. And I can walk you through a lot of the code over there um, as far as what actually it takes to make just Covox work, which is, it only takes a resistor ladder to make real Covox work, but it actually takes a lot more FPGA code to make it work in an FPGA. So anticipated costs. Um, I'm hoping to get the entire thing built, shipped, delivered, including all the packing material, documentation, everything for under 100. Um, I'm not trying to make any money off this project, but there's a lot of intangible things that go into building a large project for a lot of people, uh, as I'm sure David Murray, who's wandering around or somebody can easily attest to. Um, so my goal is to get this to about $200 um, as far as a, uh, an actual cost, which sounds like a lot, but not in terms of what you get. You get every single sound card in one on one card. Uh, no coexistence headache. You get the equivalent of an XT IDE with micro SD card storage. Uh, you get memory card with all CMS, EMS backfill. You get a network card with Wi-Fi, which is kind of an obtainium at the moment. And you get, to, you get a built-in MIDI synth. And as you can see, it was 79 euros to buy a Dream Blaster X2. So it's, I think it's a pretty good value even at $200. This is a photo of my lab. I can actually build these at home with a pick and place machine that you can actually see, but I'm not because I've spent way too much time building junior IDE boards that um, I don't want to build another one ever again. Did you clean up just for that photo? Kind of, yeah, it's kind of cleaned up. I mean, you don't, 
you don't realize how much parts cost until you have to start buying them on reels. And that's partly where that $200 comes from, is just there's a lot of overhead in terms of everything it takes to actually build this. I don't want to have to surface mount solder anything. I want it to come straight from China, fully assembled, and then just put it in a box and send it. So we've got time for some questions. This is freaking out on me. But, uh, but pl wait for the microphone. Uh, Jim's going to bring it around. I have the microphone. Um, at first, I thought that micro SD card slot was uh, exceptionally crazy. But are you going to wire it into Interrupt 13H so we can actually boot off those things as well? Yes. Excellent. Absolutely. In fact, it'll be fully IDE compliant. So there's, there's two modes to the SD card operation. One's fully IDE, and the other is kind of XT IDE, where it's just BIOS compatible. But it will emulate the IDE register set, including UDMA. Uh, we have another question over here. Um, quick question. Perfect. So uh, have you thought of adding a CPU video out and PS2 port? A what? A CPU, a video out, and a PS2 port. Yes. But then it gets ridiculous. <laughs> so. How will firmware updates work? Uh, software reflash through ISA. So the idea is that it, so the ECP5 boots through external spy flash, and there'll be a small bootloader. So it'll actually uh, be able to change the location of where the firmware image is. So it, it should. The idea is to make it where it's absolutely um, failure proof, so you, you never break a card. So the idea is to, is to reflash it through an ISA utility. And there will be an ISA config utility for actually configuring it. So it won't be strictly PMP, but you'll bring up a utility which is already kind of works and uh, be able to set what cores you have enabled, where the port addresses are, what IRQs are actually going to use DMA's assignments, that sort of thing. Any chance about putting an ADAT port on there? An ADAT port? Um, maybe. Any specific reason ADAT over speedif? Um, fiber optic. Well, it's, the speedif out is actually fiber. Oh, yeah. It's actually an optical transceiver. Yeah. Yeah. Any others? So if anybody wants to help, contribute, whatever, come talk to me. Um, it's going to be a long fall to try to get this uh, to a point where I can kickstart it you know, early next year. So. Hmm? Yeah, lots of snow days would be great. <laughs> All right, well, thank you.